All right, man. So uh, yes, we did quite a few videos on power generation, and then we did that video on the pole. Sure, yeah, we pole. did a bunch on the pole. Yeah, and then <clears throat> there was one where you broke the pole. Yeah, you didn't even know you broke it. Fifty bucks, man. Yeah, that was. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's talk about short power generation. I mean, you know, uh, the basics is that you know, short amount of distance, really powerful movement. Yeah. You got the mechanics and so on. Yeah. But a lot of people can't make it work with the pole because it's not a short distance anymore, right? Yeah. For, first of all, it wasn't that impressive that I broke the pole because number one, it wasn't bamboo, where it's flexible. Number two, it's not iron wood. Number three, it wasn't steel. It was just a normal piece of wood. Yeah. But people are asking, how come we even with a very short movement, I'm going to break the pole, even right. though it's not that impressive, is right. because it was short movement based on the mechanics. Right? It's not from the shoulder, it's not from the arm, it's from rolling of the lower abdomen and the legs, and the timing is very, very important. And the longer the weapon is, the harder it is to get short power, because, well, it's just common sense, the longer it is, the less power you're gonna get, right? At the tip of it. Right. So this idea is when you need to feel the connection. So like, it's like fishing, if, if a fish is really far, but you get a fishing line running, then when the fish pulls on the hook, you can feel it through the connection, right? Yeah, you could definitely feel yeah. it. Yeah. But the longer the line, the less the connection. So yeah. your ability to feel the connection through the, through the piece of wood extending really far to the very tip of it, there's a lot of sensitivity exercise you can do with the pole to get that kind of um, um, the feeling, right? So you, you need a connection. That's number one. Because you can't control something if you can't feel it. So you first got to feel the extension because the pole is really an extension of your body, just like any weapon. Right. Once you can feel the pole and you can work with it with the proper grip, then you want to learn the mechanics to generate that short power. But the first things first, learn how to feel first. Secondly, learn the mechanics. And the mechanics of the pole, I don't have a pole right now, but if, I, if you're hitting down, for example, right, just by sliding your hand, you're going to get more leverage. Just by resting it on your hip as a lever, as the Vulcan, you're going to get more power. Just by twisting it in a certain manner, you can get more power with a spiral. So it's not just about what you see with the pole traveling, but it's what you're doing with your body to generate that power. Kicking with the heel, dropping with the waist, rolling with the dantin, all this stuff, right? Compressing your ribs like you're doing a crunch. Right. All that will create that short power. Most people don't train long enough to get that type of power. Consistency. But even if they did, I believe that you should amplify your learning. So you can take someone and make them gain it faster using supplement training, right? Just right. by doing that, because you want to see your students improve faster. The quicker, right. the better. Yeah. So, for example, you got punching. This guy's learning how to punch a pad. Of course, there are techniques, right? You gotta learn how to shoulder snap. You gotta learn how to turn your waist. You gotta learn how to time your spine and wave into it. You gotta learn how to kick off of your leg, dropping with the lead leg, using gravity, using spinning force, lining up your elbow, dropping your knuckle, turning on the wrist. There's all sorts of your back scapula, right? So you got this mechanical work. But if you took the same person and you taught them proper weight training and you taught them proper polymetrics and explosive training, like clapping push-up, jumping on the boxes, that kind of stuff, throwing medicine ball, chopping trees down with an ax, Olympic weightlifting, the list goes on, sprinting, power sprinting. So now you take that person that was learning punching mechanics and you place explosive fitness on top of that. He's going to punch twice as hard. Right. Or at least twice as fast. So it won't take him six months to build bombs in both hands. It'll only take him three months. Or whatever the time frame is. Maybe it took him a year and now it's six months. That kind right. of thing. So the same thing with the pull. You can amplify that. Because like I said, it's about feeling at a distance. Long distance. Because the pull is about nine feet. Traditional, some of them use 12 feet. So it's a really long weapon, right? So you can say, hey, here's all the mechanics that I'm talking about. Now train... Train, 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 train till you get it. Let's say it takes someone three years to get it, which is pretty average, right? Right. Yeah. Now, you can shorten that time frame to about two years if you taught him sticking. And he should learn how to stick already because you should learn chi style way before you learn to pull, right? But in some system, they will start you off with weapons. Like uh, there's many different styles around the world that work with poles, not just Wing Chun, of course. So if, if they're weapon-based art and they've never done empty hand before, the chances of them knowing how to stick empty hands very, very low. But had they done that, anyone that's watching this that has done sticking, like prolonged contact sticking, there's two types of sticking. There is no, um, no prolonged contact sticking where you touch and go, kind of like Filipino hubas right. in Kali. Yeah. Um, and there's prolonged sticking, like 
Chinese push hands, rather it's with the body or with the hands or with the limbs, or like Wing Chun Chi Sa or praying mantis sticking. So all sorts of sticking work is prolonged sticking, right? If you have done a lot of prolonged sticking, you, you will notice you're feeling the point. So if you're making contact with the wrist, for example, you're feeling through the wrist, the points. But as you get better, everybody knows you start going up. Kind of like the fishing rod principle I was talking about with the fishing line. At a distance, you can feel the fish because it's pulling on the line, right? Well, it's the same thing when you're doing chi sao or push hand, for example. At first, you're feeling the point of contact. But as you get better, you start going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the guy's elbow. And you start feeling his shoulder. You start feeling his ribs. You start feeling all the way down until you can feel his root. That was one of the most impressive things when I first met Jesse was... Man, as soon as you touch him, he's got your spine, right? And when he's in the mood, he goes right into your feet. Most of the time, he's half asleep. He's not even trying. But I felt that, actually. You, you were there, yeah. 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 I, you know, that kind of skill is pretty scary. Yeah. Because even before you move, you go, I lost. So when someone has that ability to travel, not at the point, but at the distance, well, now when you grab a pole, a spear, the point of contact would be your hand grabbing the pole with one hand. And the other point of contact is the second hand gripping the pole. So you got two points of contact, right? But if he have done sticking before, now he can travel to the end of the pole instead of taking three years, it will take him two years, simply because he already had that in his nervous system, right? Right. So that's one way you can amplify the learning. Now, another way you can amplify this learning even faster is through Qigong. Like if you look at a... Uh, like a, some of the yoga exercise of candle staring, or if you look at internal martial art, uh, very famous, Sam Tai Sik, which is a Santique movement in Xing Yi, right? Instead of just doing a metal fist and learning the mechanics again of the backhand forming the tiger's mouth, spiraling going downward, synchronizing with the lead hand going forward and spiraling downward, the Dantin is rolling, hollowing the chest, upping the spinal cord, elongating the spine, tucking in the tailbone slightly, not too much, and then forming a V with the hip bone in the front. And then as you rest and anchor your weight with your forearm muscles into the hip joint, rather you're touching or not, depending on what stage you're at, and then you're going forward with the third eye into the finger. And as you're like doing this kind of basic work, at first when you start doing it, for most people, they'll work on the alignment and the mechanics, right? And then as you get better, you start opening up the pore and you start feeling through the bones and you start extending your intention forward really, really far. So... That's really good, too. But if you keep going, and now it gets kind of not so common, you start breathing through that line that you're projecting through, right? And this is, I hesitate to talk about this because it's going to sound really hokey unless you have experienced it. But I would say out of 100 people that do Santique, maybe 10 will get that far where they can, because most people are imagining this. It's in your imagination. You, know, you don't feel it. But once you feel that, then you go, ah, okay. Now, now you form a fishing line, right? That's a really good analogy, the yeah. fishing line, yeah. Because well, a lot of people have gone fishing. Now you feel connection to it, yeah. right? And the line itself, you could just touch the fishing rod, yeah. and you could feel whether a, a fish is on the other end, just nibbling, not even fully caught. Yeah, even the vibration, just you can the tiny, feel it. Yeah, the tiniest thing. So, so you create that line. You create that line just with your intention. But that, that line is air. Right? It's a wave of information. But now when you grab the pole, it's wood. So if you can feel that through the Santique, the candle, right? When you get a piece of wood, now it's like twice as easy. It's the yeah. same as grabbing a weight vest and running. And then when you take the weight vest off, it's easy, right? Right, yeah. So yeah. now through the principle of like Samtai, Samtai, which people do in Salim Tao, whether they know it or not. Some people do it in Salim Tao, like in the mainland version anyways, right? When they're going very slow, doing the Tan Sao, the Fok Sao, the Wu Sao. That idea is there. It's in many, many different areas. I just picked Santique for, because it's famous. So if you get that kind of work, and then you place sticking on top of it too, now when you grab any weapon, your ability to feel the tip of the weapon, no matter how far, is amplified. Once it's amplified, when you teach that same person short power mechanics that I talked about with the arms and the legs and the hips, he's going to be able to do it instead of taking three years. He can do it in like eight months. Easy, right? So that's why it's important to, in the old days, like in uh, Taoist terms, they don't just teach you Gong Fu, right? They teach you Qigong, and then you learn it together. So now what happens is the student learns really, really fast in Gong Fu because they have that 
You see how you plug in Qigong into that as an example, and it made your Kung Fu way faster? Taoism is in many ways about speed, right? It's a very uh, electric spiritual system. Like whatever works is the main philosophy of Taoism. The main philosophy of Taoism, contrary to popular belief, is not softness. It's whatever works. Like they were highly influenced by Indian work. They were highly influenced by Buddhism, for example, Hinduism. They don't care where it comes from. If it works, I want it. That's the Taoist way of thinking. That's why they invented the sailboat, gunpowder, the compass, like Gong Fu, Feng Shui, Chinese architecture, um, many, many things. Qi All come from Taoism. Well, they definitely had a heavy hand on it. So, and the Chinese language. <laughs> like, the actual. Yeah, <laughs> so the pictorial characters and all that. So, like, these guys were very practical fellas, right? So, when they taught Gong Fu in the old days, in, in Taoist terms, they always taught it with Qi Gong. Because it's like teaching punching with weightlifting. It will just make you learn faster. You can get hitting power faster right. with all the metaphors I use today, right? But the flip side is also true. I don't know if you know this, but most of the highest level Qigong guys in China were Kung Fu guys. I don't, is that a coincidence? And second thing about them is they were all hermits, not monks. So if you, uh, I'm, I'm kind of sidetracking off topic. I'll come back to it later, but because this is interesting to me. Hmm. I always wondered when I was a boy, I'm like, hey man, you got all these Qigong guys. You got all these monks. And I, that's great. But how come the top guys were always Kung Fu guys and hermits? Without exception almost. There's some exception, but almost without exception. So I thought about this a lot, interview a lot of Qigong masters. I uh, got fortunate enough to learn from some, and that was one of the questions I always bugged them about. And they all had different takes on it, but it was kind of like, um, it's kind of like the Chinese Confucian Gong Fu idea where you get this public circle, and then you get this private circle, right? So in the public circle, you teach certain things but they don't get access to internal information, only the private group. Now, nowadays, that would be called a cult, and it would be unethical. But in the old days, it wasn't, because it was wartime. So it's kind of like equivalent to the modern military nowadays. You don't share intelligence openly, and that's crazy. Right. So because it was an arms race, they would keep it pretty privately for a very practical reason, not for cultish reason, right? Right. So, so these guys were like, get this private and public. So the same thing mirror in the meditation side. So they'll get these public guys and they'll be like, all right, you guys are going to be monks. And they're like, oh. so yeah, go take care of the temple. So they, they go down a mountain and they take care of all the temples. And they were the monks, right? And they do some public teaching. They do some public service. Just like in uh, church nowadays on Sunday, they'll do service for the public. So that's what the Taoist temples did, right? Right. But the top guys were in the mountains practicing, the hermits. So they, that was like the difference, right? And a lot of people don't know this, but the top guys were hermits. They weren't the monks. So a lot of guys would travel nowadays to go learn from the monks, and I think that's beautiful, but that's not where you find the high-level guys. They're on the mountains. They, they, wanna, they don't want to deal with the public. They're like, you guys deal with the public, and you take turns. And then when you graduate, you go up in a mountain. And this also ties into the idea that you need a singa, which is what Buddha made up the meditation community. Right. Because... Most people cannot practice alone, right? I noticed that through the years, whenever I stopped teaching periodically, automatically people stop practicing. They need a support system. They need a support group. They need training partners to laugh with, to talk with, to train with, to eat with, to beat the shit out of each other with. They need that brotherhood. The minute that they go home by themselves when there's no support group, no school, they stop practicing. And if they do just very small amount, people need a support group, right? right. Buddha you know, definitely um, recognize that. So we had a Buddhist meditation community, which allowed people to develop Qigong, right? The Taoists did it. They were like a hermit tradition. It wasn't until Buddhism arrived in China that the Taoist guys were like, you know, none of our guys are getting really good. They don't have the discipline to get that good. They need a support group. So this, it, it turned monastic. They started having temples and priests. So that was the other reason why they had temples, is to have that support group to get people to get pretty good at this, which mirrors the Kung Fu side, see? So why, is Kung Fu, why are the top Qigong guys always Kung Fu guys? Circling back to that is because it gives you a BS radar. Because if you go, all right, I can feel the connection without touching from here to the candle. I learned that Qigong technique, right? Yeah, you can BS yourself all day. There's no proof of that. But then you grab a pole, you, you get hit in the head right away if you can't do it, right? 
There's no short power. So Gong Fu allow you to test your Qigong to see if it's real, then you circle back. So you test your Qigong through a physical medium. Yeah. To actually make Remember sure. Remember the last episode where I hit you and then I get you to release the tension, blah, blah, blah? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you said there's no fear? That's a physical medium. If I were to come at you for real and I said punching you, whether you have fear or not, there's no, there's no abstract BS. Like, you know, like, oh, yeah, I felt fear. No, I didn't. Now right. you have a testing ground for your Qigong ideas. Right? This is probably not clear for the viewers, so watch the last podcast we did on fear. Yeah, yeah. So Gong Fu is a way to make sure these Qigong guys were learning properly with a feedback loop so you can't BS yourself. So that's the main reason why historically most of the top Qigong guys, the guys that learned the fastest in Qigong, were Gong Fu guys. Right? Now, and I'll explain why they're also hermits. But now the flip side is true. Most of the top, top, top Gong Fu guys were Qigong guys for that reason. Because like I illustrated today, you can use Qigong to amplify your Kung Fu. But it must go back and forth. If you use Qigong to amplify your Kung Fu, you must use Kung Fu to check your Qigong. So it's a relationship that is like a chicken and the egg, chicken and the egg. If you do that and you follow that Taoist idea, in my humble opinion, you're going to improve a lot better. Like if somebody came to you and said, hey, Chris, I want to learn the Qigong system you guys do. And we do each one. We do uh, Heavy Mountain, thanks to Steve Smith. We do the medical system from Professor Jerome. We do all these systems, right? Yeah. So you teach it to the guy, all these different Qigong systems. They might take five years to get good at it. But if that person also is willing to do Gong Fu, they're going to excel at that Qigong much quicker, right? But the reverse is true. If someone came to us and learned our Gong Fu system, and we do Hakka, Long Fist, Wing Chun, we do all this stuff, right? Right. And they just do that. They can get, let's say it took them five years to get good, three years, whatever good means, right? If that person's willing to learn the Qigong stuff, it will accelerate their learning curve, right? But the problem throughout history is very few people's personality is interested in Gong Fu and equivalent to Qigong. Most people that want to learn how to beat people up are not into the art of peace. Most people that want to be, have inner peace and love are not into beating people up. It takes a weird split personality because you can sugarcoat it any, any way you want. Gong Fu is about poking someone in the eye, breaking their legs, breaking their arm, breaking their neck, stabbing them, cutting them. It's violence. It's martial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's martial, right? Qigong, and you can hook it up any way you like, but really it's about connecting up vertical, not horizontal. Martial arts horizontal. People's here. People's not up there, right? So qi, Qigong is about quantum, but Gong Fu is about dealing with life, right? So it takes a really weird person to be into the art of war and into the art of peace equivalently. Maybe that's why there's very few classically well-trained Taoists nowadays, right? Most people that do internal martial art that do Qigong very seriously are usually not that martial. They might know the form, they can do push hands, but when it comes to crunch time, they're not that into it, and for good reason. And most people that are really into actual violence are not that into meditation and healing, right? So, which now I want to give a shout out to my good friend, uh, if he's watching this, Steve Smith. He's, uh, I always uh, give him shameless plugs, so today's no exception, because a lot of guys, you guys are messaging me where to learn this stuff, and uh, I've retired from teaching for a while now, but my friend Steve Smith, who, um, he influenced me greatly in Gung Fu, but more importantly, he taught me a simplified version of the Heaven Mountain Qigong Taoist sect system and has really healed me and really helped me out. He is the inheritor of Fukien Chuan. Fukien was a teacher of Bruce Lee in Seattle. Steve, by far, is one of the best Kung Fu guy I ever met. He's also a Qigong teacher. So he's one of those guys that I'm talking about now that's two in one, which is really rare in modern history. So if you want to learn, uh, go to the thelittledojo.com. Right. And uh, you can put a text on the screen. But. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, so now going back to short power. <laughs> so if you get this split personality where this guy's into Gong Fu and he's into Qigong, now you can use Qigong to better your Gong Fu and Gong Fu to better your Qigong. Short power is no exception. In the West, short power is usually framed as Bruce Lee's one inch punch, right? Done with the lead hand only with short power. And Bruce was incredible with that. But from a classical point of view, it can be done with the lead hand, the rear hand, with sticks, with knives, with machetes, forward, upward, downward, backward, lateral, not just forward. And Bruce knew all this, he just didn't show it. He just showed it. So when people talk about the inch punch, it's like, from a Dallas point of view, that's like, that's like white belt. And Bruce knew this. He just, like I said, he just didn't want right, to. Right, right. But 
if you plug in the mechanics with the Qigong, what I'm trying to say is you'll learn three times faster. So, yeah. can you become good at Qigong without having a physical testing medium? Yes, you I think so, yeah. Well, look at the Buddha. He's sitting under the tree for a very long time, and by 35, by all accounts, he was, uh, he was a world teacher, right? I mean, actually, the first thing he said afterwards was, this cannot be taught. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. There's only one yeah. Buddha. Uh, well, no, no, there's a lot of guys that are really good that uh, Professor Jern, who I had the pleasure to study with briefly, Sifu was, um, he was really good, right? But, but he, he, was not, he was not a Kung Fu man, no. Uh -huh. He was not a Kung Fu. His dream his whole life was to learn Kung Fu. But his mother, uh, who was friends with the founder of each one, begged the founder never to teach him Kung Fu, only medicine. Yeah. And the reason is, he goes, why? He goes, because you already taught five of my brothers. Must be his uncles, and they're all poor. Kung Fu guys are poor, right? <laughs> oh, Kung Fu guys are poor. So they're like, I don't want that for my son. I want him to be a doctor. So can you please just teach him the Chinese medicine and the Qigong and the classical medical systems, but don't teach him fighting and Kung Fu? And the founder's like, all right. So, so he worked in the same hospital as the founder of each one, and every day he'll beg him to teach him Kung Fu. But because he made a promise to his mother, he never taught my teacher <laughs> fighting. He only taught him how to fix people, like medicine. Gotcha. Um, acupuncture, taught him medical Qigong, taught him each one system of Qigong, Taoist uh, um, internal alchemy, um, sealing the Qi. He taught him many, many skill sets, but he still won't teach him how to fight. So, <laughs> yeah. The guy. reason I'm asking is because. Okay. Uh, it makes sense to me the way you describe it that how do you really know your Qigong's working if you don't have a physical test in me? Uh, I look at history, like the best guys were Kung Fu guys. Yeah. Um, use Kung Fu. It doesn't lie. Or in another way they do it, which is also classically pretty common, was they became doctors. But I don't think that's ethical. Uh, it's because they're learning Qigong and go, oh, how do I know if my Qigong work? I'm going to go and uh, be a doctor. Well, a lot of guys are going to die on the table if it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Whereas if you're doing Kung Fu, it's different. If your stuff don't work, your friend knock you out. All right, okay, let's try it again. But you're not playing with sick people's lives, right? So, but a lot of times, that's how they train doctors. They have like, hey man, here's some stuff. Let's see if you can make it work. It's like, okay. Uh, um, but I think all medical systems were like that during its development phase, right? Oh, so, yeah. but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, so. Let's say today's day, day and age. Today's day and age is probably, yeah. Yeah. it's not, I shouldn't say better, but it's probably faster for you to get, uh, you know, fairly good at Qigong if you have a physical testing. I don't think it's hard to get good at anything, including Qigong and Kung Fu. What's hard is actually ha developing a practice. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. Any skill set, it's not hard to learn if, if uh, you have a good teacher, right? If someone just go, hey, man, this Qi is some supernatural stuff, you just stand like this and, and you'll get really good. Well, that guy's a... Not a good teacher. It's a yeah. quack, right? <laughs> but if a guy's like, hey, man, this is how you do it. Here's a progression. This is why you do it. This is how you do it. This is when you do it. This is how you layer one stage on top of the other. And this is how all this stuff relates to your life and relates to martial art. And here's how you test it for yourself. Ah, uh, so they would give you a testing. Well, yeah, like what? we're talking about today, even with the short part, yeah, right? Yeah, or yeah. last episode, we're talking about punching and fear, right? So direct feedback loop. Not tomorrow, not next year, not next decade, but here and now. So if you got a teacher like that, then I think you can get good at anything. 